It's been the only way they can prove that they are not taking performance-enhancing substances, that they are not cheaters. But the not-so-secret dirty truth shared by both athletes and testers is that doping really works. I felt invincible. I mean, I was the strongest female on the earth, you know, like super man. <laughs> In the mid-80s, Diane Williams, a young American track star, was taking banned substances, including anabolic steroids. At the peak of her drug use, she began to notice major physical changes. I was a freak. <laughs> I was like, mm. It was, it was not a pleasant sight to me. Some of the changes were really defined muscle mass. Uh, facial hairs, skin pigmentation, rashes, things like that. But for this highly competitive athlete, winning was everything, no matter what the cost. I really didn't have a lot of time. I had two years to really train and make the Olympic team. So even though I knew these things was happening to me, I said, well, okay, fine, I'm just going to take them anyway because that's what I needed to have in order to win. But after an inconclusive positive doping test, Diane Williams decided to try to race clean. She soon found out that she had become suspect. But once I got back in shape and ran very well, that's one thing people say, oh, she's taking drugs again. I'm like, look, test me anytime, any day, wherever. I'm clean. Trying to catch dirty athletes was Dr. Robert Voy's job when he was director of drug testing for the U.S. Olympic Committee back in the 80s. Is there a will in, in the IOC or in sport in general to, uh, uh, to find out what the incidence of drug use is and to sanction those that, that cheat? No, I don't think so. Uh, there is a tokenism that occurs. If you're a coach, if you're, if you're a manager, if you're an executive director of a sport, you don't get sponsorships if you have losing teams. It's very simple. It's money that's co that, that is the, that's the key here. And the fact that the money comes from the fact that sports is such a great exposure for television. For television networks, just as for sponsors and athletes, the Olympics have become one of the biggest money-making events on the sports calendar. NBC paid $3.57 billion for the rights to the Olympics through to the year 2008. The Olympic ideals, espoused some 2,500 years ago at the first Olympics, haven't changed. Neither have the problems of cheating athletes. For the sordid history of doping is as old as competitive sports, and goes back as far as those first Olympics. Athletes then ate hallucinogenic mushrooms and sheep's testicles, believing they improved their performances. And just like it was for those ancient Greeks, today's athletes compete not just for glory, but for rewards. A gold medal around the neck still means gold in the pocket. Just as the gladiators used to use stimulants to entertain the crowd as they fought um, in the arena, so our own athletes are now being forced, in terms of entertainment, to take ever more drugs to perform a spectacle in front of the crowd. The huge rewards for coming in first make it awfully tempting for athletes to try anything to get an edge on their competitors. And that's where performance-enhancing drugs come in. There are hundreds of doping substances available to today's athletes, Everything from the masculinizing testosterone to the deadly blood doping agent EPO and to the potentially disfiguring human growth hormone. And then there's that perennial favorite, the drug of choice of doping athletes for nearly four decades, anabolic steroids. When Frank Shorter, one of America's finest marathoners, was about to compete at the 1972 Munich Olympics, he got to see firsthand just how effective steroids could be. When I made my first Olympic team in 1972, we had a team meeting, and I liked a beer or two, and I liked to sit at the back with all the weight men who were my buddies. So we were at the back of the room, and we had a team meeting, and the team doctor got up and told us we really shouldn't use steroids. And it wasn't because it had really been shown whether they were harmful 
uh, or not. It was because it had never really been shown empirically, clinically, that they had any effect to enhance performance. And I was at the back of the room with these weight men, several of whom got gold medals, and they immediately pulled out their before and after pictures <laughs> and said, here I am 10 months ago, here I am now. And this guy's telling me this stuff doesn't work. Steroids are used during training. They build muscles. They shorten recuperation time. It was something that throwers and weightlifters had known about since the 60s. By the time the Montreal Olympic Games were held in 1976, steroids had spread like a virus through the sporting world. And by this time, steroids had also joined the list of banned substances. These Olympics were marked by some stunning upsets, especially in the prestigious marathon race. Reigning gold medalist Frank Shorter lost to a virtually unknown runner from East Germany. East German athletes seemed to be winning everything. Overnight, this tiny country of 17 million had joined the ranks of sports superpowers. Athletes who competed against the East Germans felt something was going on. Sprinter Angela Isajenko was being consistently beaten by East German competitors, and she had her suspicions about why they were so powerful. You hear the rumors that all these people are on drugs. So in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my God, uh, if I'm going to Moscow to face these people, they're so amazing and they're all on, on, they're all doping, then what chance do I have? Angela turned to her coach for help, Charlie Francis, a former Olympic sprinter who believed that steroids had radically tilted the playing field for all top competitors. The problem is to explain to someone, um, do you set up your starting blocks at the line with all your competitors or do you want to set them a meter behind? It's very clear that steroids are worth at least a meter and can you afford to give away such a benefit to your opponents? When you have a situation where you offer an athlete only two choices, run clean and lose or take drugs and win, then of course the choices will be clear. All that was important to me at that point was that I was going to become as fast and as strong as I could possibly be to compete in the Olympics. In 1979, Angela decided to follow Charlie Francis's recommendation, and she added steroids to her regular training routine. It didn't take long to see the impact steroids had on her body. I put on muscle. I might have gained about 10 pounds. And what I also noticed is that my ability to work to, to, to stay out there and work a lot longer was much better. I recovered much faster from the workouts. Charlie Francis made sure that she was on a controlled steroid program, a program which she followed for the next nine years. As a woman, you take five milligrams of, of Dianabol a day for a, maybe a six-week period to prepare you for the indoor season, and when that was over, you do another four or five weeks for the outdoor season, and that's what, that was it. It wasn't these big, huge doses and, 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 and long periods of time of, of doing them. Soon she began to win all of her Grand Prix meets. One of Angela's teammates, who couldn't have helped but notice her impressive improvement, was a young sprinter named Ben Johnson. And he, too, turned to his coach, Charlie Francis, for help. I just described the cost and risk benefits made sure he understood that uh, this is something he keeps to himself because, you know, it's banned and he can make the decision what he thinks is the way to go. Part of the problem is the Olympic champion is the person who, when they're finished, gets all this money and all the, 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 the sponsorships and, and, and all the commercials and whatnot. Not. Nobody is interested in the poor guy who comes second. When Ben Johnson stepped up to the starting blocks on that September day of 1988 in Seoul, Korea, he knew that the difference between coming in first and second was worth millions of dollars. They're away cleanly. Ben Johnson flying out of the block. Can Carl Lewis make up the deficit? Ben Johnson in the lead. Can he hang on? Yes, he's done it. Oh, magnificent. In those 9.79 seconds, Ben Johnson electrified the world. He demolished the 100-meter record. He was the fastest man in the history of the world. But to the astonishment of everyone, 
Ben Johnson tested positive. He was stripped of his gold medal and his remarkable record. He also lost an estimated $50 million in potential endorsements. Gonna have a world record by the East Germans and Ann Jordan is... At the Montreal Olympics in 1976, East German athletes seemed almost superhuman. What the entire East German team had done was unbelievable. And as the athletes were preparing to return to East Germany with suitcases full of gold medals, the Stasi, the East German secret police, were also packing. Ten suitcases full of drugs, syringes, and test tubes from their clandestine lab in Montreal and dumping the evidence into the St. Lawrence River. After the collapse of communism, Information about one of East Germany's most secretive state plans, the systematic doping of its own athletes, might have disappeared into the sea of shredded government documents now resting in the basement vaults of former Stasi headquarters, were it not for the investigative work of a molecular biologist, Dr. Werner Franke. And now I quote from their own reports, an annual more than 2,000 young athletes entering the system. Yeah, so two more than 2,000 were doped with hormones every year. So you can imagine over a period then of uh, 25 years how many cases there have been. You are looking at Cornelia Ender, the world record holder. At the East German leadership believed that their athletes' victories on the sports fields would show the world the superiority of the communist system. So it was a very ambitious, all-embracing, state plan, starting with young kids, say, at the age of seven or eight. If a child showed any sign of athletic talent on the track or in the gym or in the pool, he or she would be plucked out by party officials and placed into special sports schools. One of those children who showed exceptional talent in the pool was Karola Nitschke. Back then, swimming was my life. I didn't know anything else. I had always been at the top of my age group. I had always been one of the best. As she began to exhibit real potential, her team doctor and coaches started giving her little blue pills. She was told they were vitamins. They were, in fact, anabolic steroids. She was 13 years old. Certainly, there were things that we noticed. We were at an age when we should have been developing, yet none of us had breasts. And that was something that struck me as strange. And then my teacher commented in a frightened way that my voice had become considerably deeper. When I heard this, I was, of course, very concerned. Carolla began to have misgivings about all of her vitamins and supplements. My suspicion and mistrust really began the next year, when I was 15 years old and I was preparing for the European Championships. That's when the injection started. And shortly thereafter, I noticed that my body went through massive changes. My muscles grew at an extraordinary pace, and I became very suspicious. East German officials knew of other side effects from steroids. Young girls would grow excessive body hair. There'd be problems with their livers, kidneys, and menstrual cycles. But the officials kept all of that secret. I once tried to retrieve a vial from my doctor's wastebasket, just to read the label to see what I had been given. I got into a tremendous argument when he caught me doing this. She decided to secretly stop taking everything, the vitamins, the supplements, and those infamous little blue pills. But it didn't take long before officials were onto her. Because I refused to take the injections, team management tried all sorts of psychological tricks and even terror to bring me back in line with the rest of the team. I would use the metaphor that they shaped me into a lump, and then they tore me into little pieces and then they pieced me back together, exactly as they wanted. Only a tiny handful of former East German sports officials have had to face any criminal charges for doping unsuspecting children. Today those children are adults, many suffering from the side effects of extensive use of anabolic steroids and testosterone. 
They have come to this Berlin courtroom to give evidence at the trial of two of East Germany's most senior sports officials, including the former medical director of doping, Dr. Manfred Huppner. These officials face charges of complicity in causing injury to some 142 athletes, nearly all of them girls. Among the witnesses is Andreas Krieger, once East Germany's champion shot putter in the women's competition. For Andreas Krieger was once Heidi Krieger. For more than a decade, she was given huge quantities of steroids and testosterone without her knowledge. Her coaches called her Hormone Heidi. She not only started looking like a man, but she also developed transsexual feelings. Recently, Heidi Krieger had a sex change operation and became Andreas. As for Karola Nitschke, the former East German Olympic swimmer, this is her opportunity to bear witness against those she holds responsible. She has also decided to return all her medals and ask that her name be removed from the record books. In the summer of 2000, the athletes would be back in court to hear that those officials accused of causing them bodily harm had been found guilty. But the officials would not go to prison. Their sentences had been suspended. Thank you very much. Some 10,000 East German athletes were used as human guinea pigs in the cause of winning medals. During the 20 years that the East Germans ran their doping program, not one of their athletes ever tested positive at the Olympics. And one of the principal reasons they were able to get away with it is because of this once top secret facility just outside Dresden. This was the East German Doping Control Laboratory at Kresha. It was also one of the labs accredited by the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, to test results from international competitions. But the lab also had a top secret role of pre-testing every East German athlete who was about to leave for those foreign competitions. So there was no athlete let out of the country who had not given urine samples before. So sometimes they were waiting on the airport, you know, waiting for the telephone results from Kaisha. Is the athlete clean or not? And in some cases, the athlete was not allowed to leave the country because if they could detect uh, substances in the, in the urine. The lab at Kresha was designed to make sure that East German athletes would never test positive at any competition, especially not at any Olympics. If you think that would only be possible in socialism, you should think twice and ask yourself what would be possible in a system that is driven by money. Michael Berry grew up in Canada, dreaming of one day making it to the top ranks of cycling. Early in his career, he went off to the European circuit to see if he had what it takes. I was racing in the mountains, in the Alps a lot, and that's where you can really notice a difference. And uh, riders would just ride away, and two weeks before, they, they were at the same level I was at. It didn't take long for him to discover that elite cycling in Europe meant big business and big decisions about doping. I came back to Canada and I was thinking, man, I don't want to take drugs to win the world championships, but I wonder if that's what it takes, you know? Michael's wife, Dee Dee Demet Berry, is one of America's top cyclists and an Olympic hopeful. She's had her own experience competing on the European circuit. There's a lot of guys out there who look very short term, men and women both. They look very short term and they're willing to do whatever it takes to win the next race. I definitely get frustrated by the cheating but I also can put that out of my mind a lot easier than the fact that people are killing themselves or shortening their lives by taking performance-enhancing drugs. From its beginnings, racers have experimented with everything from strychnine to heroin to amphetamines to get any kind of edge over their competitors. More recently, a potentially deadly substance has become the drug of choice, erythropoietin, commonly known as EPO. Originally developed to treat kidney disorders, EPO increases the number of red blood cells. It's become a cheater's dream, boosting stamina, shrinking recovery time, and confounding most tests. But this wonder drug comes with a price. 
it can kill you. Because improperly administered, it turns a person's blood into the consistency of honey, and the heart just can't take it. Since 1987, when EPO first showed up on the European cycling scene, some 18 superbly conditioned athletes have dropped dead unexpectedly from unexplained heart attacks and strokes. Part of Villivot's job as trainer and masseur of France's top cycling team was to make sure his cyclists had the right kind and quantity of drugs, enough to win, but not enough to kill. La course Bordeaux-Paris, donc c'est une course qui est très longue. It was the Bordeaux-Paris race, which is 600 kilometers long and lasts approximately 12 to 13 hours. So there was no time to prepare the um, uh, the cyclist before the uh, the start of the race. During this race, Willy Wood forgot to inject one of his cyclists. Wood chased after him in his car, and when he finally got alongside him, shouted to lower his pants. The cyclist was um, bent over his bicycle, so it was really easy. I, w I leaned out of the car and I had my s the syringe ready in my hand, so I jabbed him into the, the buttocks and that was it. In 1998, as the Tour de France race was about to start, Billy Wood's team was favored to win. But was in on a secret that might explain why they were such heavy favorites. The... We had uh, three uh, cyclists that didn't take any um, any drugs at all. So, and since we had 24 cyclists in the team, that means 21 people were taking drugs. But then, Villivut was unexpectedly stopped by border police. When he opened the trunk of his car, he exposed one of the greatest doping conspiracies in sporting history. I had uh, doping products. I had approximately 200 to 300 EPU ampules. I had testosterone. I had masking products. And it was my responsibility, not the doctor's responsibility. Wood was arrested, and so was the team doctor. The Festina team was thrown out. The tour collapsed into chaos. Six riders admitted to police that they were taking drugs. And that was the irony of it all. It wasn't the Cycling Federation who caught the cheats. It was the police. Last year, Villivut published one of France's best sellers. In his tell-all book, he revealed secrets of the doping world. One of the more unusual tricks to fool testers was to have the drug-taking cyclist shove a condom filled with clean urine up his anus. When testing time came, he would release the clean fluid through a rubber tube that was glued underneath his penis, camouflaged with pubic hairs. Uh, then when the cyclist is standing in front of the um, physician performing the check, he simply removes a plug and empties the condom. In all the times his cyclists used this bizarre device, no one was ever caught. Everybody used doping, everybody. In my career, I met two, two guys who didn't use it, only two guys. Everybody, 100%. Erwan Montior was a teenager growing up in France when he decided he wanted to be a champion cyclist. I understood very early that doping was a part of the job. And uh, I was a little bit frightened because I, I, I had already heard many things about EPO, many things, many accidents, even death. I've been talking with guys in the group and they explained to me that I didn't have choice. As soon as Erwan started taking EPO, he saw almost immediately its impact. It was incredible. It changed your body, it changed your heart, it changed everything to make you become a great rider, a machine, Robocop. I had more money, more fame, more results, more everything. I couldn't think but it was dangerous. I didn't want. But Erwan didn't stop with EPO. For two years and a half, I used amphetamines, cortisone, testosterone, anabolics, gonadotrophine, gross hormone recombinant, EPO, gross factor. When you take these products, you see your body changing. 
and you feel it inside of you. I remember nights where I was for two or three, three hours, headache. You fall down, it hurts a lot, a lot, a lot. You feel that your head's going to explode. Your kidneys are like two condoms full of water, and they move inside of you. You have rheumatism in, in your hands, in your legs. The almost daily ingestion and injection of a virtual pharmacy of doping substances was taking its toll on Erwan's body. The day before a big race, I was, I was reading in my room, and I had a, a nose bleeding. All, all me, blood, everywhere. And that time, at that moment, I felt that something was wrong. Maybe I was mistaken. And then one day, he failed to pass not a doping test, but a health test. For his own well-being, he was suspended for 15 days. Erwan Montior then decided to retire, never having failed a doping test. They are searching what we're not taking. And we've taken one can, what can't be found. Wes Barnett is a six-time U.S. weightlifting national champion, a two-time Olympian, and a world champion medalist. There is such an emphasis placed on winning that uh, people are willing to die uh, to win. When he competed in Atlanta in 1996, Wes Barnett was America's best hope in years of winning an Olympic medal in weightlifting. When I finished uh, Atlanta, I, I, was, I was in sixth place. Ahead of me uh, was Ukraine, was Russia, Romania, uh, was China, was Belarus, and then me. So these are all uh, countries that, you know, have had doping problems in the past. Barnett is proud of the fact that as an American lifter, he's constantly being tested. But his competitors, especially from communist and former communist countries, are not subject to the same close scrutiny as he is. We have here at the uh, USOC uh, what's called no advance notice testing, or the athletes call it the knock and pee test, where uh, they come to your home, they come to your work, they come to your school, uh, they come to your training session uh, anytime they want. And they show up and say, I'm, I'm here to test you. And I had 13 of those last year. At the Atlanta Olympics, 2,000 out of 11,000 athletes were tested. Two were announced as positive. Could it be that everyone else was clean? Not likely. By and large, the whole testing procedure for doping rests on a foundation built on urine. But urine testing is far from infallible. The drugs they're now using, the anabolic steroids, are very short-acting and are out of their system in a matter of days so that, uh, that that is different than it used to be. They were using drugs that were fat soluble and they stayed in the system and, and you could detect them in the urine for up to five, six, eight weeks or months thereafter. Well, they're, they're smarter than that now. They're using the water soluble drugs that are very short acting. It's tough to be a tester now. There are steroid gels that can clear the body in as little as 24 hours. And then there are drugs that can mask steroids, and even the steroids themselves can be molecularly modified. No doubt about it. A clever individual, the individual who's well coached, not necessarily by a traditional coach, but by a scientific coach, can find ways to take drugs and subvert the testing. But the real Achilles heel of testing is that there are doping substances that just don't show up in urine. At the IOC-sanctioned drug testing...